The COVID-19 pandemic is generating scores of medical ethical questions. Top of mind now, when a vaccine is approved, who gets it first? Today, we turn to Dr. Michael Guzmano, a professor in the Rutgers School of Public Health to address these ethical challenges. Dr. Guzmano, let's begin with the basics. What is a bioethicist and how has your work and the work of the Hastings Center contributed to the public health crisis during the pandemic? We try to look at sort of ethical questions that are raised by medical care and, and bioethical technologies. And it really comes down to asking questions about what should we be doing and, and what kind of a society do we want to create? My colleague, Nancy Berlinger, for example, took the lead, pulling together a lot of experts, thinking about how hospitals should think about planning and setting priorities during the pandemic. My colleague, Karen Mashke, has written about issues with regard to the COVID-19 vaccine. And I, as I usually do, have spent a lot of time thinking about social justice issues and how they have played out. With a vaccine on the horizon now, I'm sure you're thinking a lot and about who should get it and uh, what order people should receive it. Tell us a little bit about your thinking about that. It certainly shouldn't go to the highest bidder. We really need to think about need. There is some disagreement about, you know, in terms of distributing this globally, whether it should be based simply on population or whether we ought to maximize benefits, minimize harms by getting this in the hands of people who are affected most dramatically by the virus. And I think the consensus is really moving in that direction. Whether that will happen or not is yet to be seen. But I, I do believe a lot of states within the U.S., for example, are thinking about protecting vulnerable populations who may be at high risk for serious illness and certainly getting this first and foremost to frontline workers, healthcare workers who are routinely exposed to high viral loads. With the virus beginning to spread, certainly in the U.S., but globally, again, the, many are asking a, a, an interesting question, which is, should the vaccine be available sooner to people at highest risk or to those that have the contact or have contact with more people? So the spreaders versus those are at higher risk. Have you guys talked about that and thought about that? If you don't vaccinate people, particularly in health care and in long-term care first, you are not only exposing them to serious illness, but you're actually exposing the people they care for to serious illness. So I think there, there's a good argument for giving priority there. We recognize around the world, not just in the US, that nursing home residents and other older people with multiple comorbidities have not fared well. And so if we can protect them early on, I think that will be important. There are varying estimates about the number of people that will actually take the vaccine, allow themselves to be vaccinated. Can a country require someone to be vaccinated? I think the answer to whether they can is Probably yes, although the enforcement mechanism would be difficult. Whether they should or not, I would tend to think no. We already have a really powerful anti-vaccine movement around the world. You can make a good case that what we need to do is make sure to build up trust. And we need sure to make certain that the process of developing this vaccine, even though it's happening in record speed, is transparent and people can feel confident that the vaccine that is approved and, and ultimately distributed is both safe and effective. Are there general principles for government bodies and for healthcare professionals about decision making during a time like this when new therapies are coming quite quickly? I think the transparency is the key here and also to explain to people why we are moving forward with things, but also why we may be holding back. The inclination is going to be to move very quickly, as we did, for example, with hydroxychloroquine and convalescent blood plasma with the use of emergency use authorizations for those. The difficulty with those kinds of decisions, obviously, is that it eliminates a lot of understanding and a lot of data that we can use to figure out whether those things actually are working. So I think it's a big obligation on the part of medical professionals and people like me who work in public health and bioethics to educate people about why we're making the decisions we make. In decision-making, do patients, do people have di a different decision-making process for thinking about a therapy as opposed to a vaccine? It's very peculiar uh, for people to actually seek a vaccine. Right? It's a strange process. You're perfectly healthy. There's nothing wrong with you, and yet you're injecting something in your body in the hopes of preventing something that happens. 
That's very different when people are typically seeking a therapy. They're usually already sick or they're injured. They're looking for relief from pain or to stave off death. And so it requires additional conversation about the threats that people face and about the safety and effectiveness of vaccines to ensure that they take them. A lot of research shows that when a medical professional, a doctor or a nurse, recommends vaccination, patients are much more likely to take it up. That inherent trust that medical professionals have with their patients can go a long way. Many providers are going to be having discussions with patients about vaccines as they answer their questions and address their concerns. Do you have advice for frontline healthcare workers on how to have those discussions and things that you, information that two people should be exchanging? Talking about the safeguards that are in place to make sure that these vaccines are safe. So for example, many people will have read that a couple of the phase three human clinical trials were paused because of adverse outcomes. But in fact, that's not a problem. It's a good thing, right? It reflects the fact that the process is working. And indeed, those trials have been restarted, presenting the data in a clear way. But most importantly, really listening carefully to why people may be hesitant. Just providing them with facts isn't going to be enough. Rather, spend some time listening what their concerns are, what they're afraid of, and why. Then you can have a conversation that's actually productive. For those people that are questioning whether vaccine trials are ethical, what would you say to them? Nothing I have seen about the way the vaccine trials are being run raises ethical concerns for me. We are doing this at record speed, but one of the reasons we're doing it at record speed is you are seeing a level of global cooperation, not only among people in labs across the world and researchers, but also among pharmaceutical companies. And that has been facilitated by government. The government is underwriting the cost, not just of the research, but the manufacturer of, of the viruses. These things take a long time. You have to grow these things. And very frequently, pharmaceutical companies are not willing to even start the large production process of vaccines until they have received a license. Now they're starting to manufacture them after promising phase two clinical trials, very small human clinical trials. We do have a lot of promising candidates. And I think the, the cooperation and the transparency with which the data are being presented are really important. Back in March, the Hastings Center released an ethical framework, guidelines to inform the work of frontline healthcare professionals. Tell us how those guidelines were developed. We were at a time when the virus is surging, certainly in New York, but in other parts of the country. And there was deep concern about the lack of PPE, lack of ICU beds, lack of, of ventilation. And so they recognized that a lot of healthcare professionals were faced with extraordinarily difficult decisions about allocating scarce resources. The document's complicated. It goes into a lot of detail, but one of the most important things that it expresses, what might be considered the ethics of planning. And it really suggests that people in leadership and hospitals and health systems have an obligation to think about the foreseeable challenges that the people working within those systems will face. They recognize that doctors and nurses are going to have to make difficult decisions and they shouldn't be left on their own to make them. There should be rules in place for how you're going to set priorities. The document didn't specify what those priorities ought to be, but it recognized from a procedural point of view that health systems need to have them. And it also recognized that this entire pandemic is causing a lot of moral distress uh, and a deep anxiety among medical professionals and attending to the needs of those people is extraordinarily important. For your team, when did COVID-19 actually hit your radar and when did you begin your work on it? We began having conversations about it fairly early on because of my World Cities Project, which looks at cities all around the, the world. And in fact, at the very start of the World Cities Project back in 2001, we began talking about cities as important places to study in part because of the transmission of infectious disease. So in many ways, what's happened here is a realization of some of our longstanding concerns. Schools of public health have been a very valuable resource throughout the pandemic. Tell us a little bit about how your work has changed at Rutgers during the pandemic from what you were doing before. My 
colleagues uh, within RBHS, the Rutgers Biomedical Health Sciences side of campus, helped to develop one of the first saliva tests. We've also been deeply involved in training contact tracers. I'm really proud of the school for the role that it's played uh, doing that. And I think the pandemic has exposed many of the kinds of injustices and inequalities within the health and healthcare systems that I've been studying for years. My team has tried to use some of our ability to look at data from across the world to evaluate the responses to the pandemic and to try to learn lessons about how we can do better. Thank you again, Dr. Guzmano, for joining us and for giving us all this great advice as we move through the pandemic and hopefully look forward to a successful deployment of a vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Warner. Until next week, stay safe and stay healthy.